the number one best self-support podcast for veterans. You are now listening to Pursuance Straight Out the Box, the power of collaboration, choice of freedom and liberation. Imagine hope, create action, visualize change. Go after the better you. Hi, welcome to Pursuing Straight Out the Box. I'm Taniki Richard. I have a wonderful guest for you. If you like cooking in the kitchen or you have aspirations of being a chef, we're going to talk all about that chef, entrepreneuring, and a little bit of black history. We have U.S. Navy veteran, creator of Food for the Rich TV series, and the star chef in brunch series Eat Sip Social on SoulVision.tv. He's also the founder of Chefpreneur Academy for Military Culinary Specialists. He's been all over morning news, Fox, CBS, radio stations, and the Food Network. We have here international celebrity chef Jacoby Ponder. What's going on? How you doing? Oh, I'm so good. Man, that was a whole lot of stuff. You got a lot of stuff going on. It it was a wonderful introduction, by the way. Thank you. Hey, it was awesome. You gave us the accolades to say it, so... Uh. (laughs) <laughs> uh, we really love what you're doing here mm-hmm. at JT Inspire on Pursuance. I'm really glad you're on the show. You like to talk about like history. You're like a teacher. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Actually, I love teaching. Actually, it's one of my. Um, I think that's, that's, that's my gift is to teach. Yeah. yeah, and knowing that your gift is to teach, you also express some stuff about African Americans living here in the United States, not knowing their nationality. And so you actually subscribe to a nationality called Moors, right? Yes, Moorish Americans. Okay. Moorish. Give us the breakdown on that. Um, well, you know, the Moor Science Temple itself was uh, founded by um, who we call our prophet, um, Noble Jew Ali, um, established it, teaching um, Negroes, blacks, and colors that that wasn't their lawful title. You know, he came at a time in the 1920s about... 15, 20 years after chattel slavery ended. So you had a, a diaspora of, of so-called Negroes in America thinking that they were just that, Negroes, black people, colored people. And he teaches that these were all labels given to slave by slaveholders. Now, he's been around for a while. Noble Jew Ali? Yes, Noble yeah, Jew Ali. Since, since the 1920s, yeah. And um, who's his uh, forerunner? Who's the one teaching his stuff now? Um, there, there's several temples throughout um America, got the USA, but um, the main temple is in Chicago. So, what made you want to get into that? Um, it it, it made, made the sense. It, it made it made the most sense. Um, mm-hmm. We are running around. I to myself uh, subscribed as being an African American, which are two continents, you know. And then once I began to learn about nationality as the order of the day, meaning like everybody on the earth has a nationality, but Negroes. Mm-hmm. And it's, and it's sad. You have to ask yourself, then what were, what were we prior to uh, 1619 and 1725? I know a lot of black folks like to go around saying, I was a king, I was a queen in Africa, but they really can't, you know, describe a tribe, describe a nation. And they have those DNA tests out there now to say <laughs> yeah. you're from the Congo or you're from Liberia or wherever they think right. you're from. Right. But still, that doesn't help us to freak identify with a nationality that's true because we're, we're looking to well first of all they're thinking that they're they're from the continent of africa when you know the united states this is north africa this is northwest africa so instead of looking to try to belong to um the people in the congo or nigeria which are our brothers and sisters we know that and try to identify with the Eurasia or Abatila, you should look to identify yourself with the Seminole, the um, Powhatan, the Pamoki, the Yamasee, the, Sem- um, the Gullah, the Geechee. There are several tribes that are ancient to this land also. And you don't have to look very far. They have monuments. They have um, land markers all over the east and west, north and south Absolutely. about our history. You just Absolutely. have to look. Even bridges, rivers. All of those have meanings, and they keep that tradition going because the ones who know, they know. And if you Absolutely. don't know, hopefully on the show, now you know. Right, right. That's, and it's very important to always uh, proclaim your nationality. Um, I think when we look at other ethnicities, uh, you ask their nationality, they're going to they're gonna generally trace it back to their forefathers. Mm-hmm. And again, which is what uh, Prophet Noble Joelle taught us was um, basically uh, you are what your forefathers were without any doubt or contradiction, you know, so that's what we got to hold true to. Yeah, a lot of the (coughs) European settlers here, the the colonists, they can trace their history all the way back to centuries. We're talking about 
1,200, 1,300, and we can't even, we don't even know who our great, great grandfather or grandmother was. No, and then that's part of the, the thing that came out of the 20s was, uh, it was the uh, Great Awakening um, in America for, for so-called Negroes who, man, you got so much great stuff happened, even in the late 1880s, or 1890s, with um, Father, uh, they called him Daddy Grace, um, huge Methodist preacher, you know, coming out of um, the North and uh, get paving the way. To, I think the Black Methodist Church was the first um, area that we kind of congregated to to uh, organize ourselves against um, racism and oppression and all that kind of stuff like that. So Tulsa, Oklahoma was born out of that movement as well. So. Absolutely. A lot of profitable, uh, professional, uh, Negro, African-American people got together and really embodied community. Of course. And we became wealthy for it. And if you don't know about Tulsa, you, all you have to do is research the, yeah. the travesty that happened with them. But you had a chance to hang with Professor Griff. I saw it on your uh, Instagram. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. How yeah, was that yeah. experience? Uh, I think Professor Griff had spoke uh, at the House of Consciousness here in Norfolk one time. And, uh, you know, Professor Griff is into the conspiracy theory. Oh, yeah. You know, it's good stuff, though. I'm, a, I'm, not, I'm not too much into conspiracy theories. You know, I'm, I'm on the history side of the house. But... With that being said, uh, a, a lot of what he's saying, you have to ask yourself, yeah, it could be true. Right. Yeah. And, I mean, who is his story, her story? Right. And then there's the real truth. Right, right. Or, so, or my, my story, the mystery. So. The mystery. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, do you, um, being a Moorish American, how mm-hmm. does that help you? We talked about chattel slavery mm-hmm. here in America. The U.S. Constitution, even the 13th and 14th Amendment still don't free Blacks or Negroes from being chattel. So how does Moorish American or that nationality help you to be free? Well, one thing people understand is um, nobody can give you your freedom. Like nobody grants you your freedom. It's not a thing that you can purchase or, you know, you have to just live your life accordingly Mm. to, you know, your your ancient forefathers, creeds and um, statutes, you know, and to your religion. Because our religion is Islamism which is the practice of peace. And the Constitution speaks to the matter. It says that um, uh, you were endowed by your creator with certain inalienable rights. Is this coming from the Quran? No, it's coming from the Constitution of America. (laughs) It's the Constitution of these shores. Mm. And they're telling you, the Europeans telling everybody that whoever created you gave you certain rights that we can't even touch. You know, so in the Holy Holy Quran, um, we we, we learned that uh, we were created by Allah. And we don't mean no spook, but we mean a lot, all laws, the law of nature, mm-hmm. um, the law of the universe, um, and canon law, which is, again, religious law. And if you're outside of those three prescribed laws, then you're an outlaw. So, you know, even when they say a law, what are you talking about? Arm, leg, leg. Well, that's something the Five Percent Nation came up with. Yeah, you know? I thought it was pretty clever, though. It I was mean, pretty it, clever. It, it is, it is, it, it is. And the God in you. It is, it is arm, leg, leg, arm, head, you mm-hmm. know. Um, and when you see me, you see Allah, you know. That's right. And that's what Jesus said. When you see me, you see the Father. Me and him are one. But the, the Quran actually talks about the Bible a little bit. Well, the Quran is it's the Old Testament. Well, it, well, okay, so now we're going to get into it, though, because now <laughs> we got them Christians out there that they super-duper Christian. Mm-hmm. They really, really don't really know how intertwined a lot of these religions are. Well, yeah, and, 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 I, and I'll say this right here as well. You know, as a, as a Moorish American, uh, we were taught not to speak out against any organization. Um, so I won't Why speak, is that? I won't speak against the church. You know, uh, Prophet Noble Jew Ali said that some of his best Moors are still in church. Right. But he also teach us to return Christianity back to the Europeans, and um, we're going to keep the Bible. Well, why not cha- challenge? Why not challenge some of these dogmatic, you know, non, <clears throat> you know, because, people making stuff up? Because, again, I got to go to the teachings, and uh, um, we, we teach that Allah, uh, the Creator, gave everybody their own portion of understanding, which is suitable unto them. It's not us, up to, uh, us to figure that part out. Right. You know, because we, we can't think with our flesh. There's different ways to say hello, different languages. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So why not different religions? Pe- well, people tend to just cling to what they know. You right. Know? If, if you and I were born in the Middle East, we would be Muslim. Well, I'm a, I'm a Muslim, but we'd be Muslims. Mm-hmm. You know, if we were born in Asia, we'd probably be Buddhist. 
So depending on where you were born at, that's all. It's the location, okay. the locale. Well, you have to be courageous enough if you want to oh, yeah. investigate and oh, yeah. research to break away from religion and, and talk about relationship. That's true. You know. You should. You so should. So have you been back? Have you been there? Been where? To Islam? Um, well, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Muslim now. I'm a Muslim myself. Yeah. Have you gone back to the old country? Oh, And no. visited the, the Black Rock I know. Ooh, look, don't y'all don't get me, okay? <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. I'm just saying. Everybody know what that black wall is that they be touching and praying to. Oh yes, see those are Muslims. Those so are, that's not those the are same. No, I'm, I'm a Muslim. Okay, break you're it down to You're born a Muslim. You you, you you can't you can't become a. It's nothing you subscribe to as a Muslim. You're born a Muslim. Um, a Muslim is one who who is a peace. They say a Muslim. They submit to Allah. As a Muslim, I am Allah. I am the will of Allah. I don't. I don't submit to like, nothing. Like Christ said, yeah. He is God and God is. They that. said that's a concept. Okay. okay. The good brother, uh, who we call Yeshua, came in and, and gave the game already. So you being of some Muslim, look, I'm Muslim. Not, Muslim. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I want to say Mazel Tov, but <laughs> I, I'm not going to do it. Pork, like break that down. Uh well, that's in the Bible. Okay. It's in Deuteronomy. You're supposed to eat beef or pork. Or but one of the prophets hoof. said he had a vision and all the foods became good. And that just opened it up for everybody to love pork. Well, I mean, you know, pig, a pig is a new species on the planet. So I'm pretty sure they wouldn't eat it a long time ago. A pig is, is a real new species. But the fact of Christians take the parable where I think uh, Jesus cast the evil spirits into the swine and they ran out the cliff. Yep. And then Legion. I, like I told you in uh, the Old Testament speaks about not eating any animal with a split hoof, you know, mm -hmm. and it teaches you how to eat. In uh, Genesis chapter two, God tells you he gave you the plants and the seeds and the nuts for the food for the body, not animals. So uh, what do you eat on a daily? Myself? Yeah. I'm pescatarian. Okay. So, so fish, fish and, and vegetables. A little of bit grains. of eggs. Well, every now and then, every yeah. now and then, every now and then. So a lot of folks don't know that if you don't get the proper protein, we got vegans, vegetarians, mm -hmm. if you don't do the right stuff, mm -hmm. you could possibly, your eyes will turn yellow, you get jaundice because you're missing B12. So, Well, well, I, I'm also on a tour right now at every library in Norfolk. I'm on my fifth library. I got uh, 10 more to go, but um, teaching the communities about nutrition. Now, I'm a certified nutritionist. I'm not a dietitian, mm -hmm. um, but as a nutritionist, I can tell you what's in the food. And I'm teaching people, you know, you should increase your vegetable intake. And here's why, you know, gum disease and heart disease is a le leading um, agent for um, death upon the black community, which heart disease comes from poor dieting, but more importantly comes from uh, stress, anxiety, environmental factors, and what you put in your body. Um, and microwaves. Well, not, not so much with heart disease. <laughs> the heart disease could come from clogged arteries and is directly related to diabetes. So diabetes and heart disease, stress, um, which produces um, a mental faculty to where you don't eat right, which creates another dysfunction. And then your environmental factors of living in the hood, being shot at, or whatever the case is, also contributes to your health as well. So That cortisol levels constantly being in a constant state of stress can... I mean, that's oh, yeah. a killer. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. a killer. You can literally worry yourself to death. Truly. Literally. Yes. Yep. Yep. And in the reverse, you missing a loved one, you can um, die of heartbreak. Yep. Yeah. Sadness. It's just Chicken. terrible. Um, so the, Stockholm Syndrome. Yeah, And then, I mean, their emotions have a real effect oh, on, yeah. on us. So oh, yeah. when you talk about those type of foods, how do you incorporate that in, as a chef? Um, well, I, I do my um, cooking classes also, and I just try to, um, I typically only use salt and pepper, and it's kosher salt, and um, black pepper, whatever the case is, and I'm always teaching them um, why they should eat certain foods. Mm -hmm. um, always got veggies in there. Always got fresh herbs. Um, so I try to illustrate through, through showing them. Do you I, ever get one of those difficult ones? They think they know more than you? Um, I think when you first come into cooking class, they, they are a little reluctant. Usually the guys, but by the end of the class, they're <laughs> hugging me more than women are, and they're like, "Oh my god!" Like mind blowing. I teach because it's mostly you know um, our people in there, so I teach them um, our the brothers that eating tomatoes uh, can slow your chance of prostate cancer. You know, just small things. Increase your water intake. Um, telling the ladies, you know, that that time of month when you do 
um, menstruate, you're losing a lot of iron. So you can use a cast iron skillet to cook your food in and take iron pills, not just um, vitamins, but minerals are very important too. I heard cucumber seeds lower the brother's uh, sperm count. I've never heard of that. Yeah, check it out, yo. I'm serious. I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm, I'm pretty sure not as much as Mountain Dew. Yellow five. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Wait, so in your classes, you have men and women, so most of them spouses in the mm-hmm. couples classes coming together, mm-hmm. cooking for one another. You you embody this atmosphere of love and appreciation. Mm-hmm. I saw on there that you, on one of the posts, you had one of the brothers bringing the ladies to the place. Oh, and, yeah. Oh, yeah. And all Serve of that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So how, how is that um, in your uh, mindset? As far as a man in America serving his family, mm. well, I did research on that a couple of um, years ago, and um, um, statistically, I found out that um, in the '40s, '50s, and '60s, and early '70s, um, a black father could support his household uh, with no college education at all, just with a, a factory job. Mm. And in 2019, uh, a black father with a master's degree have trouble supporting his family. Why so you th- what, it's what? not it's not the level of education I think that I that, that most struck me it was just like the ability for us to do for ourselves mm. and I think black men did more uh, for their families back then than now. Well, let's break down what's the modern day man brother that I mean how are they struggling? Um, mental health. Mm. Mental health. That's the that's the number one proponent of. Um, Black men from the age of fourteen to thirty-two, it, it, it's mental health, you know, and suicide rates going very up. high, very high. And a, a lot of that, I talked to this sister. Um, she's in Northern Virginia. Um, she, I forgot what tribe, um, but it's, it's really her family land. Like she's one hundred percent Native Indigenous, mm-hmm. always been here, wow. American, um, beautiful sister. Uh, and she broke down the fact of um, as as black structured families now we teach our young boys, even at the age of five, six, seven, eight, to be a man. Stop right. crying. Right. And the sister broke it down to where she said that we don't give our young boys enough time or chance to express the feminine nature in them, which is to cry, yeah. which is to be nurtured, you know. And they grow up with this mentality of always having to be tough, and they never have that outlet. So once they get older, you know, whether it's uh, turning to drugs or gangs or whatever, violence, the only thing you know is violence, and the young boy struggles so hard with that. And I saw my son; she was saying that because I'm always tough on him. You know, yeah. she said we have to create an outlet for our young males to be feminine, and it's okay. And that's why you see the whole huge rate with uh, homosexuality in the black community with our yes. young boys. It's an outlet; like they were taught not to be that way so much, to where we have to understand we are both feminine and masculine at the same time, and we let all young girls express it. When they want to break down, you got to be tough. You got to be a strong sister. We teach them both aspects. When it comes to our boys, though, we cut off one aspect until they explode. Well, you know, I think it's a defense mechanism because of the hostility here in the United States against black men. And you walk down the street, you could, you got to, there's a lot of rules to protect your own life. So (laughs) it's like y'all trying to teach them how to be men, but also how to survive. Well, their their survivability is uh, contingent upon education. Them just really know who they are, you know. Uh, we try to blame a lot of gang members and young boys walking around with their pants sagging or whatever. Well, I can show you pictures of our young brothers with suits on, being lynched, being beat, Correct. being tormented. They, they dress to the gills. It don't matter how you dress. It's it's when one um, ethnic group decides that you become a threat to their future. Yeah, you know, um, they don't they don't care what measures they take, and you know, usually like in ancient times, they will always kill the warriors, steal the babies, and rape the women, and that's been an ancient practice forever. And you know, if you want to win the war, that would be the way to go about it: just demolish completely, just demolish the the, the opposition. But when you talk about freedom here in America, um, our culture. For black people, and I'm just saying black because if it's Moorish American, African American, uh, D, D, D. yeah, there's a lot. People D-no- get hung up. Connotation, I got you. Yeah, you know, they got a lot of hang ups on which words to use. But the fact of the matter is, all the brown skinned people here in the United States that come together, there used to be a culture. Food used to be Huge a way yeah. of communicating, <clears throat> dance. Yep. 
music. Rhythm, yeah. That's the the inner parts of us that just can't go away. The DNA carries on and on and on. Right. So I see a lot of times you're doing a lot more in the community by bringing families together by teaching men and women how to cook for one another, teaching um, sisters how to come out and support one another and in, in all surrounding around food. Absolutely. Absolutely. You are a U.S. Navy veteran. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you don't eat pork, but do you cook it? Uh, I cook whatever the client wants me to cook. I mean, it's, okay. it's not my discretion to, to, you know, veer them off whatever they want to eat. You know, okay. I, I, I will advise. I mean, I'm not a... Um, doctor by any means or any kind of specialist, but or I like Doctor Sebi, Sebi, late B. great. Like, like I'm, I'm not, I'm not a doctor like that, but I will tell you what I know about okay. certain kind of foods, and we all know we shouldn't be eating meat anyway. I've tasted your food; it's, it's, it's amazing. And it's hard to like you just told me, to eat, but this, bro, these wings are good. <laughs> hey, I mean, I'm telling <laughs> and seasoned, you, and it's so delicious. It is. And at the same time, I also tell them that you know when we eat meat, if you ever took, what's your favorite meat to eat? Uh, probably chicken. Chicken. Yeah. If you took a piece of chicken breast at home tonight and you just cooked it with nothing on it, I mean nothing. It's nasty. Because you don't like the meat. You don't enjoy the meat. You enjoy the seasoning or the, the uh, flavor, the, the flavor mm-hmm. which is all plant-based. So when I take those same seasonings you put on chicken and put it on mushrooms, it's all same mushrooms, and then you have the same flavors in your mouth. Um, and it, it's just the vegetables we're addicted to. But, it's the flavor. But, Chef, your chicken... Mushroom, that marsala that you made that one time. Oh, yeah. It's his heart. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's so hard. how do you break away from, how do people break away from eating the very same things that they love? Right. <clears throat> how did you do it? That's what I want to know. Uh, I think with pork, it was easy. Okay. Like, it was an easy situation. I mean, I just, like, ah, I'm done with that pork stuff, man. And I'm from Georgia. We grew up on eating um, the whole pig, like, the everything, head, the rooter to the tutor, all of it, skin, everything. So, um, when I just educated myself on what wasn't good for us, and then beef. Once I found out how long it took for beef to digest in our stomach, I'm like, oh god. And then what were the effects of waiting for it to digest um, was even even worse. So I just kind of got myself out both of them. Um, working on chicken right now too. Like chicken is hard. Mm-hmm. I do chicken wings every now and then, mm-hmm. um, but I don't know. Something about biting into that flesh and smelling it's like oh, it's a turn off. So I'm slow to get away from chicken too. They got boneless now. Ah, it don't matter. Even <laughs> even even when I go to uh, other restaurants, uh, Chick Fil A or whatever, it's but I'd, I'd be feeling sick after the fact. Like oh, I just ate chicken. Yeah. Clumps of meat. You know what I mean? Yeah. Flesh, so nasty. So now it's becoming psychological too. It's going to be easier. So you're me. tricking yourself. No, I'm just telling myself the truth. I'm being real with myself. Like we're not supposed to eat meat. Wow. And it's okay not to eat it, and you'll okay. just be fine. And you won't look any kind of way because you don't eat meat because you're not supposed to. Meat meat causes more harm than anything to your body. Yeah, Again, and milk. Meat oh milk is and horrible, milk. but and meat milk. meat is the number one cause of diabetes. Yes, not not the carbs, y'all. No, not at all. It's, it's the not meat. the carbs. It's not the sugar. Those pastries. I was going to talk about you being in the the Navy for ten years, mm-hmm. um, and then we got back into the meat, and I had to go with that. So let's go you. back to the Navy. You started off as a culinary specialist in the Navy. Wait, wait let me just correct you. As a mess specialist. Okay, give me what's MS, the difference. MS. I was an MS. That, okay. That's, that's what that's what what they were when we could cook for real. We okay. made bread from scratch and rolls from scratch, and not throwing shade on CSs, but. When they changed the rating to make it sound more marketable, which mm-hmm. was culinary specialist, and they realized you can't get a chef job calling yourself a mess specialist. Correct. Culinary sounds more appealing. So I came in in 2000 when we were still old MS's. school. Yeah, yeah. The old last school. of the dying breed. I, I came in right when they had the two gold chevrons, like the old school mm-hmm. cats who would punch in the chest but still pat you on the back. You ever <laughs> seen Class Act? Yes. Did you have that general, the one he was... With, with um, I told you you had to be a student. Oh, you, you know what? While you're joking, we had a uh, um, the late great, uh, not late great, he's still still living, living legend, uh, Mr. Cole. Oh, was that? the first black uh, W five in the Navy. Period, across the whole fleet. Wow. And this brother was just like that. Didn't take no crap, but he would take care of you though. Yeah. Yeah. I came yeah. in right right when he was on the truth. I came in. Shout scared, out to the eighties. Scared 80s. the mess out, man. I know, man. Eighties <laughs> class act with with, with um, kid and play. Yep. Yep. Love that movie. Yep. 
So you learn most of the things that you you uh, like harnessed uh, when you got out the military after ten years. What made you want to take this to a whole international level? Um, it was something that I was used to doing already. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. I, I could I could do it with ease. And I can remember when I, while I was in the Navy, I still was like carrying on the side. <laughs> I was still hustling on okay. the side when I was in the Navy. Um, so when I got out, I just didn't know what it was called. You know, like my job in the Navy was a uh, PQMS, which is a personal quarter mess spec. I worked in the house for admirals and generals. I mm-hmm. um, worked in their, in their home. Like I, I found out after the fact, those were called personal chefs or private chefs. I found it was a whole industry for it. Oh, I could just keep doing what I'm doing, but now I get paid more for it and get more light, you know. So that's, that's what right. I went with. And now you are a celebrity. You are on the Food Network, and yeah. you cook for other celebrities, mostly out in Atlanta like that. Yeah. Uh, Housewives of Atlanta or the – you met a couple of them at the mm-hmm. – uh, I forgot what it was called, Poe. Po. Uh, the Housewives of Atlanta I actually shot on set. I was on set during one of the episodes. Mm-hmm. I think it was the episode when um, it was an old episode when uh, Portia was on that little yacht or boat. Mm-hmm. And they got the fighting on there. So yeah, I got a chance to meet all of them. And the um, ones from Potomac. Oh, Housewives of Potomac. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Yes. It's in DC. So DC. how was that experience going to Atlanta, the hub of where black folks, entrepreneurs, they really black owned businesses really make it out there? Why do you think that? Uh, well, it, it, Atlanta has always been uh, the uh, mecca. Uh, for black excellence, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Uh, home of Dr. Martin Luther King, the home of uh, the first uh, sister named Keisha. <laughs> we got a sister <laughs> named Keisha running. She's mayor down there, you know. Um, I think the uh, Black Caucus, NAACP, have always had, you know, hands in government in Atlanta. Yeah, everybody running the ground trying to get that Georgia peach. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the uh, real estate market is crazy right now. Atlanta is, is one is one of, if not the top city in America, um, for black women doing their thing, like but business owners and everything. Atlanta is also one of the highest states to have, like, AIDS rate. And, and also, I think right now it's like booming. Polygamy is booming right now um, out there. Yeah, you got to be careful with that, though. Those are just stats. Those stats are skewed. You know, they they do stats based on um, per capita, which is just basically a small area. Like, they use the word Atlanta, but they may just giving you the stats of Gwinnett County and not of Fulton County and not giving you the stats of the whole entire. And remember, family, like, I mean, Georgia is a state. Atlanta is a city. So right. don't, don't think the whole right. entire state is, is crazy because of uh, stats from a small sector. But, you know, women are having trouble out there trying to find brothers that that really can uphold a family dynamic. But but then you, you, you have to ask yourself, who's telling that narrative? Who's controlling that narrative? The black women. I'm, look, I'm just saying, y'all put some comments <laughs> below and you tell me if I'm wrong on this one. But a lot of black women are having trouble, mm-hmm. and in Atlanta too, with finding... A man like my husband, like you, who have a family, beautiful wife, beautiful children, that want to hold it down, that want to settle down. What? Well, again, I go to this. Who's telling the narrative? Is, is, are people saying that there are more, there are more gay black men in Atlanta than straight black men? See, and, I'm and, glad that you said and that. And that's the reason that black women can't get a suitable husband. When I'm from Georgia, uh, half my family lives in Atlanta, mm-hmm. and I know at least. Five of my male cousins with beautiful families and straight males and doing great. So again, who's telling the narrative? I guess it's um, is it, who your circle is around. Because is it the women who's always at the club? There's 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 a few thousand women who strip in a, in a club mm-hmm. down there. Chocolate City. Is it is it those women telling that they can't get a good man? Why not? I think a Why lot not? of single women who are professionals, and we have articles out there. They talk about, you know, black men. Number one, they think they're too good when they got a job. <laughs> mm. And then number two, if they don't have a job, they still running around. So mm. it, I think it goes back to, you know, the perspective on the black man and what, why is not not looked at as a powerful thing, a power move to bring in a sister, have a family, in the in the 
public in the general. Because I talk to a lot of guys. They are very candid in the way that they, uh, what they expect nowadays in 2020. They think the woman should have everything. Like, I mean, you, I mean, right down to the Georgia peach in the back, you got to have the front, you got to have, I mean, the list goes on. Well, well, well again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep saying this because I want the listeners to understand this. I want us to hear both sides, but I want them to understand who's controlling the narrative, who's putting out the videos, who's putting out the rap songs, who's, who's creating the Nicki Minaj's and the Megan Thee Stallions and pumping those images. And then you look over, over at Vogue magazine and look at their women, look how they look. Nobody's showing any skin over there. Like, who's controlling the narrative of the people? So if, if, if visually, if all the man sees on Instagram and Facebook and whatever other TV shows, Housewives of Atlanta, and the world is seeing this, Who's controlling the narrative of how black women are viewed mm -hmm. by black men or white men, any kind of man? So e even a, a, a white man may see a black woman as a thought now because he's been told this is what a thought looks like. Mm -hmm. Nobody even knew what a thought looked like 25, 30 years ago. You know, Hoochie Mama was the worst we had, mm -hmm. you know, and she mm -hmm. was still respected. So who's controlling the narrative of how we view our people? So uh, how do you, you know, maintain, keep your eyes front? And do your job while you serving all the single women at these events. How do you do it? Um, let's work for me. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's all work. Don't crap where you where you eat. Well, not even that. I mean, I'm. I'm don't focused. eat where you crap. I'm. I'm. I mean, you crap. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm 100 percent focused on you know what I'm doing at hand because my reputation is at state um, at all, all times during these classes. You know. And my, my wife, she's been out to some of my events. She see like the overwhelming population of just women in there. Yes. You know what I mean? And I think that, again, because that narrative is being preached, that there are no good men out here. If they see a brother, when a brother sees a sister that's doing their thing, you know, there's an immediate... Um, um, attraction. Well, I don't say attraction, but, you know, I, okay, you know, this may be a suitable situation right here. When, in reality, that person is doing it, is, that, that's their job. Like, that's, that's work for them. That's not the reality of how they live, for real. Especially with me. You know, I have a family, but I also have a public image that's to right. portray, you know. That's right. So it go, it, it's a maturation. It's the maturity of the the man doing the job and knowing that this is what is going to bring home the bread and butter to the family. Right. That, I mean, you, you look at your, I mean, I'm a, I'm a Z-lister. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> you know, you get the A-list celebrities, mm -hmm. B-list celebrities. <laughs> I'm a Z-lister. <laughs> so you can imagine the, the brothers like um, Kevin Hart and... Other oh yeah, top the celebrities pressure. who go through the pressure. a lot, and I watched this documentary twice. Um, man, it's powerful. I mean, I, I looked at it. I saw myself in a lot of what he was saying. Um, when you have so much pressure on you, and you know, he just goes, goes. He don't even eat. Forget to eat. His wife was fussing to make him eat. I'm always getting fussed at about eating. You know, just the the, the drive. The drive you got to have to to stay that. And uh, Steve Harvey put it away one time. He said, "People who want success, when you get success, it's like." Knocking out 20 push-ups, you know, that's one milestone. But imagine doing 155 push-ups consecutively. At 155, that's your peak, you successful. Then you got to lock your arms. You got to hold it and stay that way. Mm. That's how much pressure it is to be a celebrity or be successful. And, you know, I think one of the entrepreneurs on Shark Tank, he said he was getting two hours of sleep. Yeah, two yeah, hours. When, yeah, when, when you try to, I don't, I don't sleep much either. When, when you, you try to... You sleep when you're dead. But sleep <laughs> is actually one of the major things to keeping yourself healthy and drinking water. So you got to sleep. You got to sleep at certain times, too. Your circadian rhythm, along with the earth and the way that our brains work, sleep actually helps to decrease depression. It helps to uh, keep you happy, vibrant, energetic. Oh, yeah. I don't, I don't dispute that. But, you know. Most people who are millionaires are very successful. They don't sleep. And people who are not so successful sleep all the time. And they they sacrifice that, though. You know what I mean? If, you, if you're not where you want to be, look at how much you're sleeping. Or what time you're getting up. It ain't getting sleep. Just If you're getting up after 8 a.m., uh, you're only giving yourself a very short window to get stuff done throughout the day. You right. know what I mean? Versus right. if I'm up at 6, by 8, I don't got a couple things done already. So, um it's just, I don't know, man. It's, for me, it ain't so, sacrifice. I just go. For for one of your events and you're cooking and you're doing all those things, uh, how, what time do you normally get up to prep to get this stuff going um, with your team? Uh, the team do it. 
They do everything. Well, they'll do everything. Um, I I do about 70% of the lifting. Okay. Get them 30%. And uh, that's the that's <laughs> Is that slowly... in pay too? <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. I mean, that team, they get paid on time. They get paid very well. I mean, you know, I, I take on more people who are inspiring to be where I'm at. So yeah. they're, they're usually junior chefs or just getting started. Are they almost there? You know, I don't, I don't deal with nobody at my caliber, I think, you know, yeah. and pay them out four five hundred dollars an event. No, I get the novelists, the ones who want to learn and right. you know what I mean? And they're not there for the money. Right. I still compensate them very well, but they're not there for the money. They're there just for the, to be around it, to be in it. So the Chefpreneur Academy, mm -hmm. you created that. You're the founder of that. Yes. Give us that vision. Like, how did you go from just uh, being a, a chef or private chef and then expanding it to uh, an academy where you can give back to other veterans? Wow. Yeah, I mean, well, uh, cooking is, is my passion and teaching is my gift. So I've always had both, you know, mm. the passion for cooking but the gift of teaching. So... Um, with Chefpreneur Academy, I, I decided to put both together and see how it worked out. And it worked out well because I already was teaching cooking classes already. And I was a um, professor, adjunct professor for two years at Stratford University. So I taught, I know I can teach it. I taught at a um, college level um, for two years. I'm like, I'm able to teach curriculum. So it was always in my forefront. And then uh, I got the opportunity to mentor 20 Navy CSs. Mm. And I figured, well, what better way to do it than just teach them? And uh, created the curriculum along with um, past manager I had. And two nights, we wrote the whole curriculum. And then Monday morning, it was books printed and logo. Everything was up and running. And they came through the door. I had my media team there, and we just captured it. Man. And it took off. That's um, amazing. To the point now where TCC, the college in Norfolk right now, uh, we're going to relaunch it in April. Mm -hmm. But this time, I'm going to open it to the public for free. Wow. So you have One some week. real big sponsors. Well, yeah, TC, they're going to do all the marketing for it and everything for That's it. That's amazing. And, uh, uh, they thought I would have a problem with giving away for free. I said, no, I, I'm, I'm going to give them a week free. And I'm going to attract so many people. They're going to want more. That's and right. And that's when we charge them. There's a book called uh, Give Away for Free also that I ordered. But it teaches you to, to give stuff away for free. Yeah. You know, and if it's good product, they'll come back. Yeah, speaking of that, we have our book, JT Inspire Principles for Change. Mm. And on there, you can go on our website, jtinspire.com, and get a little free ebook when you put in your email. I want to stay connected with you, awesome. and I'll give you a little free ebook. And then you have the full Principles for Change with me and my husband that talks about overcoming trauma. And you got connected with Tim Reed, uh, actor. <laughs> For Solidify Productions. Yes. It's like a, a new TV streaming network. How did that hook up? How did that happen? Man, um, well, uh, people, if you go to my YouTube page, um, uh, The Real Chef Jay Ponder, um, I've been doing this for a long, like recording myself mm -hmm. for years. Like I've always had a production team. I'm out, of, I'm out of town doing dinner parties and just running through grocery stores and um, I got inspired once I was on CHOP on Food Network. I got a chance to see the back part to the production. Like, oh, wow, they got cameramen everywhere. And I kind of fell in love with directing. So I started, like, directing my own videos. And um, people don't know, like, a lot, like, 90% of the videos, I had a huge um, play in them as far as uh, writing treatments for them and just making my vision come to life. And I said, well, how would I view this event? Um, so once I started recording everything, um, I got kind of tired. It's a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Here late recently, I got kind of tired. And a um, friend of mine, I was talking to him That's about- That's because you need to sleep. <laughs> no, no, no. No, I'm joking. Go I don't mean, mean sleepy. Tired. Yeah, like, tired like, of doing that. Like, it's okay to sleep, but do you rest? Um, mm -hmm. Come on. So um, I talked to him about it. He's like, man, you know, just give me some encouraging words. And he actually made one phone call. He's like, you know what? I'm going to try something. Mm -hmm. And he reached out to Mr. Um, BK Fulton. And just what happened, BK was just kicking off the network. And just what happened, BK looked my stuff up and was like, oh, we got to get this brother. And he emailed, I didn't even believe it. He, I emailed him first, reached out and told him where I was and would love to be part of the team. He emailed back the next morning, six o'clock in the morning. I read the email. I'm like, nah, this ain't real. You know, this whole setup. And it's Soul Vision TV. You know, I was yep, like, ah, this ain't real. Looked into it more and actually found out, oh, this is a real thing. And when, uh, when he talks about uh, showing, uh, portraying our people, uh, in a positive light, he's serious about that. Yeah. Because we definitely need it. And that's what I said earlier. 
And that's why I stuck to this gun earlier, but who controlled the narrative? Right. Now, with Soul Vision TV, we control our narrative right. on how we look. You know, He's making movies like Harriet and um, several other movies about uh, when it comes to black history, yeah. but telling our story our way. Um, my cooking show, I'm talking about how to eat healthy and showing you the backdrop of these really fly events that I do that are all black couples and they're power couples doing great things and you know we can we can eat fancy and look fancy too but just yeah. controlling the narrative of how we look so I'm very excited to be a part of um, Soul TV so you have those two um, shows that you're starring in uh, Food for the Rich mm -hmm. and that's your show that's your baby Mm -hmm. That's the one that you filming all over celebrities oh, yeah. and uh, and locals alike. Locals I mean, alike, like yeah. Just, it's not you know good food, celebrities, yeah. Good people. That's it. A good time and a good time. That's it. And then you have Eat Sip Social. And yeah. me and my husband, we've come to one of your Eat Sip Socials. And mm -hmm. when I'm telling you, it's it's to the level. It's got a real nice poetry vibe. Oh yeah. Um, lots of artsy types of folks, uh, people, entrepreneurs. You actually yeah. empower other vendors who come there. Oh yeah. All we time. always buy something when we're there. Always. So you're trying to give back by also bringing people together mm -hmm. at the Eat Sip Social. How is that going to transpire over onto the network? Uh, soulvision.tv um, well again we, we, we're now going to let the um, let because it's, it's a global um, network mm -hmm. um, to let the world know see us you know in our own light with greatness you know ESIP Social is mainly around brunch and uh, various events but just again controlling our nat narrative and showing us you know we don't need those other food networks controlling what we can and can't do which you barely see us on their network anyway um, so now we're going to have our own culinary scene we deal with food and family and great time and and uh there's gonna be a little bit of drama in there but it's gonna be all good though hey good <laughs> drama too you gotta know what you gotta be yeah. real right authentic and that, television that's what it is. there's no script like these shows are unscripted most of the time unfiltered other than when we do the post production uh editing but they're 100 what it is if something dropped on the floor something spilled or we burnt our hand it really just happened and you know hiccups happen when you throw in an event people Absolutely. don't see what happened in behind the scene the, the, with food they don't see what happened before the day before and the shopping and the prepping and the loading the truck unloading the truck set up and they don't see none of that stuff they just see the food but we're gonna get to see it on all your show it, from the food roots, for the roots to the two to all of it yep, all, all right it. Yep. good i'm so glad that you came on the show to hang with me i'm hoping that you come back oh this is dope I yeah definitely will. Definitely yeah will. okay so if you want to reach out to celebrity chef international celebrity chef jacoby ponder you can go on instagram at the real chef j ponder hit him up on instagram or check out his new digital streaming network soulvision.tv on his new show Food for the Rich, and Eat, Sip, Social. Thank you so much for listening and tuning in to Pursuing Straight Out the Box. Listen, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at trrichard4 or go to my YouTube channel at JT Inspire LLC. We'll have more episodes with more guests right here on Pursuing Straight Out the Box. Thank you for listening to Pursuing Straight Out the Box. Join me on social media. Leave questions and comments on Instagram at trrichard4, Facebook, Taniki Richard. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel, JT Inspire LLC. Tune in next time for more courageous topics right here on Pursuance, straight out the box.